This is Isabel. I'm here to introduce the host, my mom, Elise. All right, let's start the show. You're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Elise Hugh. On Monday night, my five-year-old was lingering too long in the bath, and I checked my phone. And probably like a lot of you, a friend had texted me with the news. A draft opinion leaked from the Supreme Court shows it's poised to overturn Roe v. Wade, the 1973 ruling that legalized abortion nationally. Justice Samuel Alito wrote it. It reads, It is time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives. Given the steady erosion of reproductive freedom over the past decade or more, the fall of Roe is something many were anticipating. After all, about half of U.S. states have either already severely restricted abortion, passing laws forcing clinics to close or criminalizing providers, or are ready to ban the procedure if and when the high court overturns Roe. This wasn't a surprise, and yet reading the words on Monday night, seeing how frankly they were written, it's different, right? It's different when you see it. That's journalist Shafali Luthra. As a health reporter at The 19th, a news site on gender and politics, Luthra talks regularly with those seeking reproductive care and with physicians who provide abortions. One of them is Dr. Jennifer Kearns, an OBGYN at the University of California, San Francisco. Reading the writings of Justice Alito kind of lays bare just how removed uh, Justice Leo and, and the rest of the court and the majority opinion are from this issue. It's sort of like we're living in two different worlds. Um, you know, when you sit in front of patients and hear their stories um, and see them sort of moving through their lives, it feels like a very different world than that that is painted by Justice Alito. Dr. Kearns has been traveling from the Bay Area to Oklahoma City to provide reproductive care given the outsized need in some parts of the country. So we called Shafali Luthra and Jennifer Kearns to help us process what a post-Roe America will look like. Dr. Kearns began by sharing a little about her patients. You know, it's really people from all walks of life. Um, just a, a couple weeks ago, I was in Oklahoma. Um, the clinic has been seeing a lot of patients from Texas since SB8 was enacted in Texas. And those patients are, you know, people who are traveling anywhere from three to 10 hours to Oklahoma City for their appointments. First of all, many of them had very similar stories, which was uh, something like, I missed a period, I took a pregnancy test, found out right away I was pregnant, got into a clinic, and uh, they detected a heartbeat. So it was sort of like some group of people who were best case scenario in terms of detecting pregnancy, and they were still incredibly delayed and, and burdened in terms of accessing abortion. And of course, that doesn't paint a picture of the scores of other people who couldn't make it out of state, who didn't have the means, didn't have the social support, didn't have the funds, or detected pregnancy much later, um, and that delay pushed them past any um, gestational limits. Wow. I saw patients who really talked about their decision to undergo abortion as a decision that was right for their family. Um, I saw one patient who had four kids. She was in her mid-20s. She um, had just gotten a new job and was looking forward to some economic stability in her family and really felt like this was the way that she would be the best parent to her existing four kids. So it was really, it's a decision that comes from a place of love. And I think what's what was really it's just a stark contrast on Monday night when I read some of Justice Alito's writings in the Politico report. You know, his his writings and the anti-abortion movement have really sought to dehumanize people who seek and undergo abortion and to dehumanize people who work in abortion care. And uh, you know, even the language that Justice Alito uses by using the word abortionists, um, incredibly dehumanizing language. The way that the movement, that the anti-abortion movement talks about patients who undergo abortion is incredibly dehumanizing. And so my experience, my colleagues' experiences, um, the experiences of patients I see is actually one uh, that's totally opposite that. It's one of, of deep connection to humanity. Shafali. When the federal protection for abortion falls, as it is expected, walk us through what is likely to happen. What can we expect the immediate impact to look like? So every state is different. And there are right 13 states that have these so-called trigger laws on the books, right? Laws that are meant to ban abortion as soon as Roe is overturned. Five more okay. states that don't have trigger law, or yes, also have these laws from prior to 1973, that would ban abortion 
but haven't been enforced right for decades. Some of them okay. go back to the 1800s. What, what the question there is, is what will it take for these laws to be enforced? And some of these trigger laws are written so they would take effect right away. Some require the attorney general to certify the opinion. Others require action from the governor. Some will take a month to take effect. With these pre-row bans, there is a lot of open questioning about whether they can be enforced immediately or whether yeah. they have to be repassed. There is actually a lawsuit or two lawsuits in Michigan right now to answer that very question. Hmm. It's very possible that we see right 18 states ready to ban abortion within weeks of Roe being overturned, especially given how clear the language of this opinion appears to be. A decision like this obviously affects everyone in various ways, but who will experience the most direct effects? It's the people who have the fewest resources to travel, right? The ones who have historically been marginalized by our system because if you live in a small town in, in southern Texas, right, if you live near, near the border, it, it can cost hundreds or thousands of dollars to get somewhere where you'll be able to have a legal abortion. That's money that people don't have. And those with means will be able to find states where they can access care. But the people for whom in some ways an unwanted pregnancy could pose the greatest burden are the ones who will be affected the most. You know, it's estimated that somewhere around 300,000 people will be affected um, by this decision in, in, in terms of living in states that are projected to, to ban abortion. And the projection is that about a third of those people might be able to manage leaving the mm. state. So that leaves, you know, a couple hundred thousand people that we're talking about who um, will be denied access to an abortion. And we know what that looks like. We've learned this. We've learned this story before. Um, We've learned it in this country. We've learned it through research. More recently, we know that being denied an abortion, you know, leads to increased poverty, having to stay in uh, abusive relationships, existing children um, staying in poverty, not being able, uh, the the woman not being able to achieve educational outcomes, as well as physical health problems. Um, Yeah, this is to say nothing of the health risks of pregnancy and labor. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Well, in the meantime, what kind of workarounds are you seeing in states where abortion access is already restricted, Shafali? So obviously travel is a big one. One thing that we're talking about and that has emerged in Texas is the possibility of ordering pills online, correct? And we did see some folks order pills in Texas through this organization called Aid Access, right? Which sends medication abortion pills from Europe. Now, this is really complicated because we know it's very safe, but it is something that is outlawed in a few states. And even in states where it is not, there's a real risk of being prosecuted under under other sorts of charges. We just saw in Texas, right, a woman who allegedly tried to induce her own abortion was thrown in prison. Mm. And the charges were dropped eventually. But what this really speaks to is that this so-called self-managed abortion, right, through medication, it is safe, but there are real risks. And the folks who are most likely to bear the risks are those who are already most often under police scrutiny, right? Most often people who are lower income, people of color. Gosh. And at the same time, there is in all likelihood going to be a really strong push from Republican state lawmakers, especially those who've succeeded in outlawing abortion, to go for these pills next, right? To restrict when and how they can be mailed, to put new penalties for trying to induce an abortion on one's own, and that will only make it harder for this to fill in those gaps. Yeah, that's exactly right. This this is not the norm in our country to be um, accessing abortion outside of the medical system. And yet, with the restrictions and then with this pending post-Roe world that we're going to be in, it is likely that self-managed abortion will be safer for some people, meaning um, it'll be safer to stay outside of the medical system. Um, you know, we what we saw in Texas with the person who was uh, arrested was that there was a disclosure of this by medical personnel, and there are states that are that are moving to require healthcare providers to disclose this kind of information. Wow, some states are going to strip healthcare privacy too. Then. That's exactly right. And this is very different state by state what healthcare providers are required to disclose to authorities. 
Okay, Dr. Kearns and Shafali, let's flash forward to five years from now. What will abortion and other reproductive health care look like in America? What does a potentially post-Roe world look like? Oh, boy. There's a lot of ways this can go. Um, I think it is pretty fair to say that if not a majority, that a substantial number of states will have banned access to abortion. We will see really intense need in, in blue states, right, where folks are traveling for care. The bigger questions, and that the ones that I don't think we have answers to, there's two. One is, given what happens in federal elections with, with Congress and with the White House, is there momentum for a federal abortion ban? And this is something that some Republican senators are talking about, and there's a question as to whether Republicans are willing to take that step. But it is on the table and something we should be talking about. And then the other thing that this, this draft opinion really brings to mind, right, is what comes after abortion, right? There's been a lot of talk for years about whether the anti-abortion movement moves on to contraception next. Um, a lot of the folks I've talked to who are involved in the anti-abortion movement think that Plan B, the, the morning after yeah. pill, should be limited or prohibited as well. Yeah. And even looking beyond reproductive health, the draft opinion right raises questions about gay marriage protections, it raises questions about interracial marriage protections. And once we go down this path of overturning Roe v. Wade, there is a real possibility for a dramatic change in the rights that have been won over the past 50 years or so. Yeah, boy, it's such a rollback of where I think we all thought that we were. It's like a blip in time since um, since SB8 was enacted in Texas, and I'm already hearing stories from some of my colleagues in Texas of people with life-threatening ectopic pregnancies, oh, which is a pregnancy that implants outside of the uterus. That's yeah, very dangerous. Um, and very dangerous and needs to be treated immediately. Um, stories of those patients being transferred outside of Texas. So the fear that is going on among um among healthcare providers is is real and the people who are victims of this all are you know sort of everyday women. I don't know the way that this is going to go politically. What I do know um you know is that one year, two year, five, two years, five years from now we're going to just see suffering kind of writ large. Um we're going to see a lot more morbidity. We're going to see an increase in maternal mortality. Um, that is Which a, is already that's high a story in the U.S. compared to the rest of the world. Correct. Um, you know, I think we're all bracing ourselves for being on the end of, of, of this and trying to figure out how to best support people in, in their health and in their lives. What kind of conversations or reactions um, have you heard that you would like to hear more of or you haven't heard discussed in the fallout from this SCOTUS leak that maybe we should kind of keep an ear out for? I think the voice of, of patients is just so incredibly important. Um, last night, I spoke with a woman who had traveled from the Dallas-Fort Worth area to Oklahoma City to get an abortion. And we were talking about how she felt about the Texas ban and the Oklahoma ban and the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. And what she felt most was like offended because she thought about this a lot. And to have this this thrown at her that, that she hadn't, it was really dehumanizing. And I just think that these are the voices that we don't spend time emphasizing when we talk about the national story of abortion, or not as much time as we should. And these are the people who matter because they are the ones who who got pregnant. They are the ones who sat with this. And in my experience talking to patients, it's not something they take lightly. Shafali Luthra is a health reporter for the 19th, and Dr. Jennifer Kearns is an OBGYN at the University of California, San Francisco. She's been traveling to Oklahoma to provide reproductive care. Thank you so much to both of you. I know it's been a crazy week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Coming up, a slight change of pace. We're talking books. I chat with authors Jasmine Guillory and Emma Straub about what we should be reading this summer. This message comes from NPR sponsor, BetterHelp. Stress shows up in all kinds of ways. In a world that's telling you to do more, sleep less, and grind all the time, here's your reminder to take care of yourself. 
do less, and maybe try some therapy. BetterHelp is committed to helping you in times of stress with customized online therapy. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash minute and see if it helps life feel a little bit easier. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Dignity Memorial. When you plan your celebration of life in advance, it becomes a gift from you to your family. Because nobody should have to plan for a loss while they're experiencing one. With Dignity Memorial Providers, you can pre-plan every detail to give your family and yourself valuable peace of mind, knowing that everything will be taken care of with professionalism, compassion, and attention to detail that is second to none. For additional information, visit DignityMemorial.com. It's May, and that means we're putting away our winter wardrobes in favor of summer wear. As the weather warms up, I'm putting away my winter books, too. I've been reading a ton of nonfiction, and I'm eager to shove it aside in favor of snappy, fun summer reading. But as high as that stack of books on my nightstand already is, I always love new recommendations. So I called up authors Jasmine Guillory and Emma Straub to get their picks for what to read when the sun stays out real late and what goes into a great summer read. All right, let's get to it. Enjoy. Can you first start by introducing yourselves and how we might know you? I am Jasmine Guillory. I have seven books out now. My new book, um, By the Book, just came out. And you might know me from The Wedding Date or The Proposal, which were my first Mm -hmm. two. Um, And I write romance novels. So I am Emma Straub. I'm Jasmine Guillory's biggest fan. (laughs) Um, I am a novelist and a bookstore owner. Um, I own Books Are Magic in Brooklyn, New York. And my new book, This Time Tomorrow, comes out in May. So exciting that y'all both have books about to come out or just out. Y'all are here with me today to talk about summer reading. I know it's still spring, but Memorial Day is just around the corner. And I want my stack ready. So is there something first just to kind of establish this conversation? Is there something about summer and going into this season that makes reading or the way you think about reading different? For me, for summer reading, I want books that I can like, I think about the books that I want to read if I'm in a hammock. I haven't actually been in a hammock for a long time, but that's what I picture in my mind. Like, I want to be there. I want a book that I can just, like, open and then two hours later come back to Earth and realize, like, oh, my gosh, it's been so long, but I've been deep into this book. Like, those are the books that I think of when summer reading. Like, plenty of time on my hands to just throw myself inside of a book. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think for me, it's like there, there's no like, there are no genre requirements or even subject matter requirements for summer reading. It has much more to do with like the propulsiveness that I want. Like I, I really, I really want something that I don't want to put down. That's my favorite kind of book to read in the summer. Yes, exactly. I totally agree. Do y'all's books fit in that category? Because I want to give you a chance to talk about your books that are coming out. I mean, I will speak for Emma. I think her (laughs) books absolutely do. You know what? Let's do that. Jasmine, why don't you talk about Emma? And then Emma, why don't you talk about Jasmine? I love it. I think that's a great idea. I love Emma's books. I uh, cannot wait to read this next one, even though I have been told it's going to make me cry, which is not (laughs) a thing I usually like to do for books. But I will do it for Emma because every time I open one of her books, I never want to put it down. Hmm. Emma, it's called This Time Tomorrow. Will you give us a quick synopsis? Yes, yes. Thank you, Jasmine. First of all, I love you. And I the check the check is in the mail. Um, uh, So this time tomorrow is about uh, a 40 year old woman who has a uh, dying science fiction writer father and it's her 40th birthday and everything kind of sucks. And then she goes out and gets too drunk and wakes up and it's the morning of her 16th birthday in 1996. Um, so it's what I like to call my autobiographical time travel novel. Because, oh. you know, this is how it happened for me. How am I to tell other people how their time travel works? Uh, <laughs> but this is how mine works. What was 1996 like? 
For me personally, I was 16. Life was awesome. I was a very heavy smoker. <laughs> um, and my parents bought me a case of champagne for my birthday party and everybody barfed. So 16 was awesome. Oh. 1996 was awesome. The halcyon days of youth. Yeah. All right, Jasmine, your book is called By the Book or your latest book is called By the Book. Tell us a little more. So By the Book is a contemporary reimagining of Beauty and the Beast mm-hmm. with uh, a black woman as the as the princess mm-hmm. in this story. It is published by Disney, so there's a little, I try to sprinkle a little bit of magic throughout the book. Not real magic, but, you know, just I wanted sort of that magical feeling. Isabel is a publishing assistant. She's sort of um, feeling a little discontented with her life. She hears kind of a... A side comment from her boss about this guy who is, is supposed to write his memoir and hasn't done it. Um, he is a former child star. He sort of disappeared um, after signing this big deal for his memoir. So she goes to his house and kind of bangs on his door to see oh. if he will deliver the book and then ends up moving in with him as they work on his book together. And then they fall in love. Oh. <laughs> well, yes, I, <laughs> I imagine that would be the case. Yeah. <laughs> Emma, how do you know Jasmine and what are you excited about with her book? Okay, well, thank God that Jasmine Guillory is as productive and prolific as she is. Because every single time Jasmine publishes a book, I read it instantly, like immediately. If it comes into my house, I put down whatever I'm reading and I start reading hers. It's really fun. It's really fun to see someone whose work I love play with this story that we all know. And Jasmine's books are always smart and funny and sexy. And one of the things that I love about by the book in particular, that there, there is so much food in this book. (laughs) Yes. There is so so much food. They're always eating. And then when they eat something delicious, Honestly, Jasmine, I, I like I have never seen this written in a book before. I think that's why I'm so fixated on it. But when they eat something delicious for dinner, they have more. <laughs> you know? It's it's like it's something so absurd that like I do all the time. Like if I'm making a lasagna, I'm not stopping after one piece. I'm like going to go and like pretend that I'm not having a whole other piece, but like You are. I am. And uh, that is what the characters in this book do. And oh, I love that. I just, I love it. I love it. So yeah. thank you, Jasmine. Well, thank you, Emma. You're wonderful. You're I welcome. did not pay her to say this, but I would have. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, you have a lot of us out in the audience that would say the same thing. So I'm really excited about all this food conversation, too. <laughs> all right. I want to hear the tried and true books that you would recommend to any friend looking for things to read on their vacations or even at home this summer. Jasmine, you want to take it first? Yeah, I'll start. So my first recommendation, it's a young adult book called Love Radio. It's by Ebony Liddell. It comes out um, at the end of May. It's a young adult romance about these two black teenagers in Detroit. You know, she's a girl who hates all things romance. She can't wait to get out of Detroit and go to college. But he's this radio star and he has this show called, like, he's a teenage love doctor where he gives advice to people about um, their relationships and he is trying to get her to go out with him and bets her he can get her to fall in love with him in three dates. (laughs) And so it's just like like such a fun read. It, there's so much joy in it, but it's also about real things that they're dealing with about family and growing up and leaving home. And I just, I just loved it to pieces. Emma, why don't you share one of yours? Yeah. Okay. So I will, I will also start with the romance on my list, which is called Funny You Should Ask by Alyssa Sussman. This is one of those books that like even before I opened it, I just knew, I just knew how much I was going to love it. It's about a journalist who writes a profile of a movie star that is quite sexy and it gets very popular and like he's like his star is on the on the rise and it it becomes sort of a part of their story Mm. and the novel follows up with these characters like 10 years after when he is sort of like he's sort of on the decline but she has like published books and like this essay about him has has sort of made her famous and it's a romance and it's just it's really funny and I just 
it was one of those books where I was just like, oh, no, no, I'm just going to read one more chapter. I'm just going to read one more chapter, which is the best kind of book, of course. I like that you have both introduced recommendations that have A, a radio star, and B, a journalist in them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right. What else? What else? (laughs) Uh, this is Jasmine. I'm going to go, I'm going to switch gears. And this recommendation is about a memoir. Mm. Um, it's called Bomb Shelter by Mary Laura Philpot. Mm. It's a memoir and essays. It reads so fast. It starts with an incident where sh- her teenage son has a seizure in the middle of the night. Um, she and her husband wake up and hear this and sort of go running. And then the whole book is sort of goes forward and backwards about their family and their lives and how they how they all sort of come together about this incident and what happens and it's just about like ha- how to deal with you know someone that you love going through something scary you have your own anxiety about it you're trying to be there for them what yeah. to do yeah. it's it sounds heartbreaking and it is but it's also so funny i laughed so hard during parts <laughs> of this book um and i read it i think in two or three days i mean it was a quick short read and also just like i couldn't stop reading it so many people will really understand this book because i think so many of us have gone through this feeling of like a loved one has a sudden emergency, what do I do? Yes. Um, and mm-hmm. often often it's, I can't do really anything. I just have to be there for them. And I just loved everything about this book. I'm glad you brought up funny because, Emma, is there a particular funny one in your list? There is, Elise. How did you know? I did it, you know? but I'm so glad. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny that, like, funny books are quite, tricky. It happens all the time that people come into the bookstore and they're like, I want something kind of funny. And it's, it can be a real stumper. I'm going to give you the book that made me laugh the most recently. Uh, It's called Sorrow and Bliss by a woman named Meg Mason. It's sort of like a Sally Rooney sort of feeling, but 10 years older. Like it's about a a British woman who has, again, been a journalist. It's romantic. It's sexy. It's hilarious. It confronts mental health issues in a way that I just hadn't seen before. It also sort of reminded me of Fleabag. Oh, Fleabag okay. a little bit. Yes. It's got sort of Fleabag vibes. That's going to get some readers. Yeah. So if you liked Fleabag, I heartily recommend Sorrow and Bliss. I want to read that. I've never read that. Jasmine, let's round out the rest of your list. Um, so th- this is a- another book that I just like ripped right through. It's called The Lifestyle mm. by Taylor Hahn. It's her debut novel. I picked it up one night and it-, it-, it was that exact experience where like hours later I was like, oh, I guess it's time to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when that happens. But I just got so deep into the story. So it starts with a woman who thinks that she has her whole life together. She has everything just how she wants it. Everything is perfect. And then one day, late at night at work, she and her husband are both partners at the same law firm. She walks into her husband's office and he's in there having sex with an associate. Mm. Um, And, you know, sort of her whole life that she kind of thought was perfect is kind of falling apart. But she's like, nope, I'm going to fix it. And her way of fixing it is that they should become swingers. It's just like (laughs) such a funny fun story because and then you know at a party of course she runs into an ex-boyfriend i'm not going to spoil what happens but i (laughs) just like had so much fun reading this book the whole story was just so fun to read and i can't wait to talk to other people about it and we are going to have the list all on our website so this is going to be available at npr.org for those of you who have missed the titles emma anything else on your list that you want to talk about Yeah, yeah. So one book is called I'll Be You by Janelle Brown. It's a mystery, thrillery book, suspenseful, I would call it. It's a suspenseful book about two sisters who are, I think, sort of Olsen twins inspired, like former child actors who are now adults. One of them has a totally perfect life and one of them is like the disaster and it's about what happens when the one who has the you know supposedly perfect life uh basically 
joins a cult. And so you've got child stars, you've got drug addiction, you've got cult, like it's got everything one could possibly need. And Janelle Brown is one of my favorite contemporary writers for relationships between women. In this book, it's really all about this relationship between these sisters who are at this point quite estranged. I love it. I love her books. And this is a great one. Getting through the whole stack of all these books that sound so engrossing is tough, for me anyway, because it's not like I'm on vacation for the entire summer. So what tips do you have to make time to get through our summer reading lists? For me, I have always been a person who just brings a book everywhere I go. We're on our phones too much, I think, sometimes in this world. So it's nice. What? Really? I know. I know. (laughs) Terrible, right? And so if you have, like, that time when you're waiting in line or when you're, you know, on the subway or you're waiting to pick up something, you can just pull out a book and, like, spend those 10, 15 minutes deep into another story. I also am a big, like, I read in the bathtub every night person that is where I get like the bulk of my reading done um there's some some books where I have like gotten the bathtub opened it and then like come to life three hours later shivering because I was so deep in the book but <laughs> I'm always scared I'm gonna electrocute myself because I read on a kindle <laughs> yeah, with the with the e-reader <laughs> I, know, I, know. I love reading books in many different formats I like ebooks I like paper books but I feel like the bathtub is a good place for the paper books because <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind dropping my books in the bathtub. I don't want to electrocute myself with a <laughs> device. Um, so, so yeah, so I think just like finding your, your like snatches of time where you can read is, is great for me. I totally agree with Jasmine. I think it's all about just having that book in your bag no matter what. I also have started in the past few years listening to audiobooks. Mm. I hope you don't mind if I give a quick plug to Libro FM, which is my preferred audiobook company because it's independent and works with independent bookstores. And so you can buy audiobooks and some a percentage of it goes to your favorite independent bookstore, which I love. But I, yeah, I like will just listen to books. Like I listened recently to Mel Brooks's most recent memoir. I don't know if he's written other ones, but it's called All About Me. And I listened to it and it's so wonderful. And Mel Brooks just kept me company while I was like doing the dishes cool. and folding the laundry, all of those things. So that that is a like a really time efficient way to sneak in more reading. Yeah, I'm, I mean, you know, it's the beautiful thing about owning a bookstore is that I have more books than I could ever read in my entire lifetime. What a dream. Don't you feel, Jasmine, that like every time you get to pick what to read next it's just like a little gift to yourself yeah absolutely that scholastic book fair feeling right Mm -hmm. (laughs) i relate to that 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 joy of like what do i get to read next oh it never goes away i gotta say as y'all have been sharing these recommendations i've just been sitting here writing notes of the (laughs) book titles even though i know that i can go back and replay this interview Um, Thank you so much for all these great books. I know I'm already adding a bunch to my list. Emma and Jasmine, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been so great talking to you and talking to Emma. Yes, such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And will the two of you stick around to play a quick game? Yes. Yes, I'm scared, but yes. Okay, fantastic. (laughs) Who said that is coming up next? That's after the break. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Best Fiends. Why put off having fun for that so-called free time you keep hearing about? You already do enough to earn it. Best Fiends is the mobile puzzle adventure game that gives you a little fiendish fun anytime, anywhere. Customize your team of characters and find even more ways to win with year-round events. Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. Plus get $5 of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. This message comes from NPR sponsor Audible with the memoir It Takes a Woman. Hollywood producer and author Devon Franklin explores the emotional journey behind the women who raised him. Listen to candid conversations on topics such as marriage, death, regret, and triumph. Devon invites you to learn the valuable lessons the women in his life shared with him. 
Visit audible.com slash it takes a woman. Okay, we're now going to play a game called Who Said That? Ooh, who said that? Who said that? We're going to do things that? a little differently this week. Ooh, Here are the rules. I'll share a quote from a book that's been adapted for the screen, and you'll guess who said it or which TV series or movie it's from. They're all very popular because I know you <laughs> ladies were a little nervous yeah. about playing Who Said That. <laughs> and I'll even give you more hints if you need okay. them. Okay. There's no buzzers. You can just yell out the answer. And as usual, zero prizes. You win nothing. <laughs> just bragging rights. But this is still a competition. We're in capitalism after oh, all. Oh, God. All right. All right. <laughs> Are you two ready? Yes, we're ready. Yeah. As ready as we'll be. Okay. Here's the first quote. I wasn't aware that my eye line fell under the jurisdiction of school rules. Maybe I should say it faster because I feel like the character would deliver it faster. I wasn't aware that my eye line fell under the jurisdiction of school rules. Oh my God, I, I literally have no idea. Jasmine, do you have any idea? Um, the Jenny Han book, what was that? Lara Jean. Oh my God. Yeah, we need a better clue. All right, here's a hint. I should have read the quote in an Irish accent. Oh, the... Is it normal people? Okay. <sighs> One point for Emma Straub. That was Marianne Sheridan, the protagonist in Normal People by Sally Rooney, adapted for TV by Hulu. That quote is from a scene where Marianne is sitting in class looking out the window and her teacher eventually calls her out. Marianne, something outside caught your attention. I suppose so. Eyes forward, okay? And Marianne's response to her teacher is that she didn't know her eye line fell under the jurisdiction of school rules. Got it. Did y'all watch the show? No. I assume you no. read the book. <laughs> I did read yeah. the book. I did not watch the show. Sorry, Sally. The show was very well done. Very well done. Okay. Point for Emma. That's Emma one. <laughs> Jasmine, nothing. But no. this is your chance to tie it up. Okay. <clears throat> if you're going to be sad, you might as well be sad in Paris. I tried to say it like the character. <laughs> I don't know if that worked. I'm not an actress. I'm a journalist. If you're going to be sad, you might as well be sad in Paris. Um, I mean, is Emily in Paris from a book? I don't think that was a book. Um, okay, forget it. I, I know, that was, anyway. my, that was going to be my first guess. But then I was like, I don't think that's a book. Okay, here's my hint. Go back to the mid-aughts. It's a little earlier zeitgeist. Oh my God, Elise, you are like... <laughs> Just, just letting y'all flail about. Okay, okay. So disappointed Here's in us. More, more hints, more hints. XOXO. Gossip Girl. No. <laughs> that was Blair Waldorf. <laughs> Blair Waldorf, the character <sighs> who owned more headbands than any one person should reasonably have. What are you doing this weekend? Eating leftovers and feeling horrible. No, you're coming to Paris. If you're going to be sad, you might as well be sad in Paris. <laughs> Did either of y'all read or watch Gossip Girl? Oh, I watched it religiously, yeah. Oh, good, 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 okay. (laughs) Okay, for the winning point, final quote. If you were mine, you wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. (laughs) Bridgerton? Fifty Shades of Grey? Or whatever. Emma got it with Fifty Shades of Grey, though Bridgerton was a really good guess. Yeah, I know. Fifty Shades of Grey, that was a quote from Christian Grey in the movie Fifty Shades of Grey, originally a book series by E.L. James. And it started out as Twilight fan fiction. Yeah. Uh, Christian (laughs) says this. You're like, "Mm, yeah. Yeah. yeah." Really great turns of phrase in there. Um, (laughs) He says this to his love interest, Anastasia Steele, as part of his seduction. If you were mine, you wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. What? I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know if it's a reference to, I assume it's a reference to spanking. I think so. I think so. so. Okay, Emma Straub, you won. Congratulations. Uh, Congratulations, Emma. I feel so proud of my performance. (laughs) That Um, was really good. Oh, yes. Jasmine, don't you think we just did like a smashing job? Uh, Yeah, we were really incredible at that game. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thanks for playing authors Jasmine Guillory and Emma Straub. Thank you both for joining us today, too. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, a delightful (laughs) time. Hi, I'm Elisa's daughter, Ava. 
Now it's time to end the show like we always do. Every week, listeners share the best thing that happened to them all week. We encourage folks to brag, and they do. Let's hear them. Hi, my name is Shantanel McClendon, and I live in a suburb outside of Cleveland, Ohio. I wanted to report something so happy, but also that was so sad. Um, Like many parents, it's a bittersweet experience having to watch your children grow up. Well, she came to our bedroom this morning and she told me that I could sleep in and she was going to make me and her father breakfast. When we got up, she had the whole table set. She had table mats, she had party favors, she toasted us toast, and she even made my uh, lunch for work and it was just so beautiful. This is Paul in Brooklyn, New York, with my story of the best moment of the week. My daughter is away at school, and Thursday night, about 9 o'clock, she calls me and says a package was delivered for her, and I should go outside and bring it in. So I go to the front door, and there she is with a box of pizza. A friend of hers was driving down from school and she just decided to take a ride and surprise me and it was the greatest, the greatest surprise. Hi, it's Paul. We got the news that my daughter is engaged to the love of her life. I know that, um, you know, uh, you can't pin your happiness on other people's happiness, but when it's the person who has brought you so much joy for her entire life, you just can't help it. Cheers, Eric and Maddie. Thanks to those listeners you heard there, Chantanal, Paul F., and Paul C. Listeners, we want you to send in your best thing to us at any time during the week. Please just record yourself and send a voice memo to our new email address, ibam at npr.org. That's I-B-A-M at npr.org. All right, that's it for us, folks. This week, It's Been a Minute was produced by Andrea Gutierrez, Liam McBain, Barton Girdwood, Chloe Weiner, Janet Ujung Lee, and Asia Drain. Our editor is Kitty Isley. Our director of programming is Yolanda Sanguini. Our big boss, NPR's senior VP of programming, is Anya Grunman. I am Elise Hugh. Take care of yourselves and talk soon, y'all. <laughs>